Hello there guys, it's Matmus. Welcome to the channel. We are doing something a little different today. We're actually going to be doing a, I guess, kind of a discussion between people within my Discord channel, or technically today we're in a TeamSpeak channel, but these are avid followers of my channel, uh, actually really good friends of mine that have a whole host of knowledge. Uh, hands down, I can't explain to you enough how good these guys know their shit when it comes to aircraft, games, and... Um, Tanks, which in fact there's a gentleman in here who knows pretty much I think everything to know about tanks, um, Damien. But uh, what we're going to discuss is three different topics, which will be armor, uh, aircraft and gaming. Now we're going to try and do this, we're not too sure depending on schedules how much we're going to do this in terms of frequency, but we are going to be doing these kind of discussions here and there and kind of giving you guys a little of input in the comments section of what you'd like us to discuss in the future as well. So today's topic, uh, topics I guess, firstly will be armor, we'll be debunking the myths of anti-tank weapons and armaments on tanks, specifically the high explosive anti-tank round, uh, which is actually something that I need to learn a little bit more about because I'm kind of offset with my old anti-tank weapon systems and such. The next one we'll be talking about the beautiful Eurofighter Typhoon and our opinions on that particular aircraft. And finally we'll be talking about Steelbeast Pro. Now if you haven't seen Steelbeast Pro guys, it is a tank simulation software slash game. Everybody has their own opinions on what exactly it is. But it is a simulator. And uh, everybody in this channel that's with me right now, uh, uh, mostly players, uh, or have played the game before, so we're going to put our own little opinion on what we think the game should have in the future, and the kind of features and vehicles that we wish it would have from ECM Games. But before we go ahead and actually touch base on our first subject, I'm actually going to introduce the people who are in this channel with me today, and we'll just go from the top here and I'll let you guys say hello, so say hello guys. Uh, Damien42, checking in. Hi, here's Damien, nice to talk with you. And it's Ghost Talk here, have no fear, a nerd is here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome here at the talk, and I'm Jor here as well. Oh, my name is Phoenix. Spring time, I see F-22s on a daily basis, so I don't work <laughs> on them. <laughs> Okay, so there's all the gentlemen that have kindly joined me today, and I would really appreciate it, guys, if you could go either check out their YouTube channels, which will be in the description below, or feel free to come by onto our Discord channel, which is The Legion, and come introduce yourself to these absolutely awesome guys. Very good friends of mine, and uh, I really do appreciate you guys for stopping by. So, without further ado, we're going to go on to our first discussion, which is the effects of high explosive anti-tank rounds and tank ammunition, and that will be started off by a good friend of mine, Damien, he's going to roll with it, and uh, off you go good sir okay so first things first we need to explain what exactly is high explosive anti-tank ammunition in the past it was named uh, shape charge uh, warhead or shape charge ammunitions because as the name suggests it's uh, a shaped uh, high explosive filler with uh, in the most mo modern designs uh, with an insert made from uh, copper or, or different metals like tantalum, uh, sometimes even depleted uranium. Uh, and this insert uh, connected with the shaped charge creates a shaped charge jet. What is the jet? Jet, uh, contrary to most popular beliefs, is not um, molten metal plasma that molds or burns through the armor. It's actually a solid projectile in form of a jet, of course. This projectile have, uh, contrary to other types of anti-tank munitions, very low mass, very low density, and thanks to that can travel at uh, very high speeds, sometimes like uh, several miles per second, uh, and thanks to this it has enough um, kinetic energy and, en and creates enough pressure on the armor plate to actually start nearly displacing the armor material on the molecular level. Um, it's kind of also called uh, or described as a metal or solid body reacting like a fluid or water or fuel or like something like that. And this is how exactly shape chart uh, jet works. So in a way it's a kinetic energy projectile, but it's classified also as chemical energy because it's based on the energy created by the explosive charge. Now, uh, what about the lethality of uh, shape charge jet? Well, truth to be told, it's not as lethal for the crew and vehicle as it's mostly described. And what's that? Uh, why that happens? 
Uh, first, uh, because the shape charge jet have a very small diameter, and I mean very small, like extremely small. Sometimes when we talk about smaller shaped charges, you can take a pencil tip and try to put it into the penetration uh, channel, and it will not fit because shape charge jet is so small. Of course, it depends also on the uh, shape charge uh, warhead's uh, diameter or caliber, but in general such holes are very small. And thanks to that, the shape charge jet can miss everything that is vital, vital inside the vehicle, like crew, ammunition, fuel, etc., etc. Of course, the problem starts when the fragments from the shape charge jet will hit the ammunition, and when we mostly see the vehicle that is destroyed by the anti-tank guided missile or the RPG is because the ammunition inside was hit by the shape charger. And this is the primary, the most basic killer of the armored fighting vehicles and their crews. However, there are other ammunitions that are more lethal without uh, actually hitting anything important. For, for example, kinetic energy penetrators fired from the tanks. And this is another reason why today, in case of tank munitions, uh, high explosive anti-tank ammo is actually left behind in development. There is a push to completely get rid of the high explosive anti-tank ammo and replace it with the high explosive multi-purpose ammunition, which is pretty much just high explosive round with a programmable fuse. So you can program it for um, air burst, uh, airburst or uh, classic uh, detonation or even armor piercing mode, and you can imagine how uh, armor in armor piercing mode, a high explosive front penetrating a thin skin BMP, uh, what damage it can do exploding inside and killing everybody. Mm -hmm. so this is how exactly it works. So, if anyone have a questions, because as you know, a very wide subject, and I can just sit here and talk. <laughs> I've so, got one for yeah. you. I've got one yeah. for you. So, I used to play the old Armored Fist 3 um, series from Nova Logic, and it was a fantastic game, and I always was interested by the different armament uh, that you could use in the game. One of the rounds was the staff round. Now, I know you just mentioned the MPAT round. The staff round, is that the, exactly the same kind of thing where the charge is actually shaped on the bottom end of the shell and fires down towards the top of the turret with the programmable fuse? Well, uh, the staff was an experimental round that used uh, the EFP warhead. Okay. The EFP warhead is a kind of uh, shaped charge warhead, however, uh, the insert is much thicker and it's um, more shallow in shape. So it, the explosion creates, um, let's say, something like APDS projectile sized object uh, that uses kinetic energy to pierce through the armor. And how actually the round worked is uh, that it have a magnetic sensor, oh. so it it's 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 not uh, fired directly into the target, but slightly above it. And when it uh, goes above it, and the sensor senses that there is uh, a large uh, metal object beneath the projectile, it detonates the warhead, wow. and the AFP projectile attacks from the top. Wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. I did not know that. That's pretty neat. Mm. Uh, I have a question. So, uh, we've seen many videos from, or many quite harrowing videos from Syria and such, of various uh, anti-tank weapons being used on, of course, older generation tanks. Uh, however, recently we know that either Russia or another source has sent um, their T-90 tanks to Syria, and there's a, a good video of, a, of probably the first ever encounter of a Western anti-tank system impacting and having an effect on a uh, modern eastern uh, tank. Uh, I'm sure you know the video I'm talking about, uh, the one in Syria where a tow two, uh, no, a tow something or other hits the T-90 on the front left side of the turret and we see crew bailing out. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first things first. Uh, the tank, of course, is equipped with the soft kill active protection system Stora 1. However, as many people will say, but hey, Stora would protect it. Or, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. First, the Stora needs to know that there is actually someone aiming at your tank. Mm -hmm. So it will fire both small grenades and will start to use the infrared dazzlers. 
However, the toe does not use uh, laser range finder, so the Shtora does not know that actually someone plans to fire a toe uh, into the protected object. Another thing is that the modern toe variants are immune to the Shtora or, or are not as affected as the old models. Uh, because right now the missile does not only have the infrared marker but also ultraviolet marker so there are, uh, so the guidance system sees the missile in uh, two frequencies uh, you know optical frequencies uh, and the stora works only in single frequency at a time so you know the Stora would not protect the tank. Another thing is that the tank was probably most likely penetrated because the area where uh, the vehicle was hit is not protected by the composite armor, neither by explosive reactive armor. If anyone ever seen a P90 drawing or a good photograph from close up, you can notice that uh, the area around the gunner primary site and just next to the main gun is not protected very well by the ERA because there are large gaps there. And uh, if you have, uh, for example, a cutaway of the turret, uh, it's available to be found in the internet, you will notice that this area is protected only by the fin, uh, cast or roll, depending on the T90 variant. Uh, armor. So it's possible that the round penetrated that area and uh, we can suspect that the gunner was harmed and this is maybe one of the many reasons why he jumped out. We don't know what happened with the commander. Driver was probably okay. And another reason why the tank uh, didn't uh, explode it because the T-90s in general do not have ammunition in the turret. Everything is below, and if Russians instructed Syrians not to take additional ammunition and only take ammo in the autoloader, there was a big chance that uh, there won't be ammo cook-off that will end up with flying turret. And so, mm. Damon, do you think that the person who delivered that tool deliberately aimed for that area, or was it maybe just a lucky hit? Uh, you know, it's war. So everything yeah. is pretty much luck and bad luck. Uh, it can be coincidence, it can be planned, it can be deliberate or not. It's, it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. I think the interesting part with that particular scenario is um, what's happening now is in the pleasures of YouTube is, or not just YouTube, but any kind of information source when it comes to military footage is when something like that happens, you, they're already exposing the weaknesses via YouTube or via this footage. So, you know, thousands and thousands of people are commenting on, wow, that was a good hit. That's the weakness of that vehicle. These people follow, you know, these these outputs of different media outlets and are finding mm. the weaknesses mm. in these vehicles from simple sources such as someone taking a video camera and watching this tow missile hit the vehicle. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, and I reckon that'll be the future of... Um... Well, almost um, tidbits and tank design. Oh, okay, so um, Ivan, our T90 doesn't fare too well for the uh, space between the gunner and the gun. Let's put some more armor in that place, but well, it's very interesting. You know, actually, the militaries are keeping attention to that. I don't know if many people is actually aware, but the United States Army is working on another variant of the Abrams and even on the new tank that will replace the Abrams. Oh, did you cut that? Oh, no, he's still there. Because it's still in the development uh, phase, very early development phase. But we can see what happens with the Abrams. For example, the armor is improved, and the armor will have greater mass, greater protection. Uh, already, from my estimations and estimations of my friends that are, you know, digging into the subjects, are that the the M1 A2 Seb V3, the new variant, will weigh something above 65 tons, mm -hmm. metric tons, uh, while the Oof. current variants weigh yeah. 63 and a half tons. So you can see how large is the weight increase in the, in the armor itself only. And the vehicle will later also receive uh, active protection system and still will be able to use the add-on armor in form of the explosive reactive armor from the task kit. So 
believe me or not, but the armies that actually are keeping attention and observe that, they gather the data. If if can, they can uh, even take the weapons uh, used there to te to testing, and they are completely resigning from the lightweight armor because it has no survivability at all on the modern battlefield, be it asymmetric battlefield or worse, conventional large scale battlefield. So we are kind of returning to that um, part up. of the Cold War at the mid to late 80s where everyone was like, screw it, we don't like light armor, we are moving heavy because this is the only way to survive on the battlefield. This is how it is. Nice. Okay, so that was uh, interesting uh, little tidbits there. I learned a few different things, especially I was interested with that staff round. I was always curious how it worked in game on the old Armored Fist 3, but that was cool. So what we're going to move on to now then um, is the Eurofighter. Now, we all know it's quite an impressive fighter jet. Uh, has quite a substantial history behind it. And uh, it's apparently very specifically touching to me because I'm British and I'm sure Figma and a couple of others will agree to me. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to go from the top to the bottom of the room and we're just going to give our own couple of minutes of spiel of what we feel um, is our opinions on this particular fire jet. And uh, then we'll just kind of quickly go on an overview between us as a group and go from there. So I'll go from the top, guys. So just uh, give me a couple of minutes of what you feel about the, uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon and your opinions and thoughts on it. Uh, well, as you've said, Matt, I'm massively biased because it's the fighter I hope to go <laughs> on and fly. Uh, yeah, but um, it's good. Uh, I've got more experience with it than the, the most people. I was lucky enough to be uh, given access to a simulator at um, an RAF station that I will not mention the name of in case people hunt me down. Uh, and it is certainly a very capable little system. Um, I'm open to questions on it. I don't really have much spiel with it apart from it's very good and I can't really give a spiel without any questions directed towards me, so I'll pass on to Damien. Well, I can't really say a lot about uh, aircraft. For me, Eurofighter is just another flying thing, but I have a question for, for example, uh, you know, I've seen data that says that Eurofighter is actually more expensive in Oh, that pushed the stock. Mm, more expensive than what? More expensive than uh, F F22A. Mm. It's certainly interesting. Um, without the base cost being well revealed to me, I would assume it's quite expensive. Uh, let me just very quickly go and brush up on this because it does change on the new variant, which is the Tranche Four. I think when it comes to a cost of a fighter jet, it comes along with the majority of the maintenance and equipment costs that come with it, right? I'm sure the base standalone fighter jet of the F-22 is probably going to be a little bit more expensive than Eurofighter, just to the fact that, well, for first of all, it's a bigger plane, um, and bigger normally means more expensive components. I work in the aviation industry and know fine well how much... Uh, rare materials like aluminum. Oh my god, I said aluminum. I know all my haters are going to hate me for saying aluminum instead of aluminium. But, uh, you know, the cost of rare materials goes up. So when you're looking at a bigger plane, that's definitely something to consider between a cost variation between the two. Okay, let's see. The thing as well is the procurement process. True. Um, getting an F-22 airborne was a much more expensive thing mm -hmm. than the Eurofighter because the Eurofighter was split amongst three countries. It was, and I'm looking at the cost of vision now, and it's actually quite good. With Britain taking um, the majority of the percentage built and engineered there, with Spain just behind us, and actually Germany just behind us, and then Spain, uh, so we're not on the list. The original three, it appears, have it. Uh, we're looking at. Uh, an expected production summary, uh, the UK having 160 units, Germany having 143 units, Italy having 96. And it coming down to actually some quite obscure countries like Saudi Arabia are going to have 72, Oman want 12, and Austria want 15. Interesting. And Kuwait. And Kuwait also, yeah, they want some as well, 28. Awesome. Also, also remember that the F-22 is set at 185 aircraft. They're not likely ever to make any more, so that's going to affect the upgrade price. For sure. Anyway. It is very true. And from what I can uh, tell you now, it is not as expensive as a base production F-22. And also, don't forget that this thing may cost more in terms of upgrade. As, um, as this thing gets older, it will cost more to upgrade. As with the F-22, even though the F-22 has a better... Um, upgrade system as it's more of a current system than the Eurofighter is. True. Uh, but one thing I can give you is that 
the Eurofighter is not to be underestimated. I almost compare it to a British F-16. It is a very, very capable fighter. Good comparison. Very capable uh, bomber. And um, for the pilots that I've talked to, they say it is absolute joy to fly. Isn't it true that uh, the jet is technically made purposely unstable? I know it's kind of a... Is it a myth, or is it true that it's purposely that made unstable? very true. In fact, Matt, I can tell you now, the F-16 cannot fly without computer without computers in it. Interesting. It is extraordinarily different. The yeah, and the Eurofighter is the same way, right? Eurofighter is even more so. Right. Has uh, anybody ever seen the film of the uh, Saab Gripen having the same problem where it had the flight control failure at the air show? No. They just started wobbling and became uncontrollable. Yep. It's, many of the fighters nowadays, because of the extreme maneuverability demanded by nations to, uh, cap- you know, to cope with all this modern stuff and the uh, maneuverability expected, uh, is so great that a human pilots cannot physically you know, uh, cope with the amount of inputs that are being needed to keep your aircraft in a sustained term yeah. at ridiculous yeah, I mean, We're talking hundreds attack. of input changes yeah. a second. Yep. Um, for example... Uh, I actually remember reading that when they were to... Oh. I mean, it's um, very interesting, the canards in the front, I know people uh, don't mean like those, but the fact that this thing can pull well over 40 degrees of angle of attack in a sustained turn, that's what, I've, that's what it's been rumoured at. Interesting. Okay, Ghost Dog, what's your point uh, on the on the Eurofighter? What do you think? I think this, the Eurofighter was um, a great result for... For the people that got one, um, I think they every I think all the nations that got involved in it learned how not to do it on the tornado, and then got it right this time. To right. be honest, Joe, That's what's your cool. thoughts? What do you think of it? Wow, I don't really know much about. Planes, <laughs> to be honest, um, all I know is that they offered my country to uh, leave the F thirty five project and get these ones with a huge discount, and my country said no. Oh, so, really? Idiots. Yeah. <laughs> well, third question, third question is my way. Those who are uninitiated into aviation, I'm sure Ghost and I will be more than happy to oblige. So. Mm-hmm. Well, my... Well, I ha- Go ahead. I have one point. Uh, I think it will be interesting one. Because we need to ask ourselves at some point, is, uh, is it worth to design a fighter jet that are not stealth? And I mean, you know, stealth is not a magical tool that makes you invisible, but it's like a camouflage on your uniform when you hide it in the grass, the same is for stealth in the air. And considering the huge development in anti-air systems, especially in Russia, and the Russians are absolute, uh, I would say, leaders in the anti-air systems, you know, there is a point when you need to ask yourself, how survivable is this aircraft that is not stealthy? And I mean, not even fighting against other aircrafts, but against uh, ground-based anti-air. Well, my opinion on stealth is that it is not as necessary as people think it is. Having stealth, don't get me wrong, is a massive multiplier. However, the problem is is that it is quite finicky now, and radars have, have got our detection systems in general have got to the point now where they can do all sorts of absolutely amazing stuff. I'm sure, as you say, Russia is the world beater currently um, anti ground based anti aircraft systems. Oh, I uh, that. Yeah, and I'm sure they will have easy ways to detect stealth fighters. I've heard rumours about 3D radar detecting in three dimensions, all sorts of satellites doing stuff now instead of um, normal radars, yeah. X, Y, and Z. And to combat this, I'm actually I've done a lot of up on the systems of um, not just the Eurofighter Typhoon, but most modern-day upgrades to fighters, especially the F-16. And they're saying now that being able to defend yourself, both passively and actively, is a lot more de- is a lot more important than just relying on stealth. I think on the most um, I think the event that actually keyed the West onto this the most was the shoot down of an F-117 over Serbia by a 1960s SAM. <laughs> yeah. I mean, an SA-3, I get an SA-3 shot down an F-117 Nighthawk uh, by using a radar triangulation method, uh, which was very interesting. Hmm. So now a lot of money is being put into things like towed radar decoys and um, I'm sure Ghost Dog knows about this, but all sorts of the um, active countermeasures for actually firing lasers at missiles to confuse their um, guidance systems or uh, pumping out more advanced forms of ECM, uh, stuff that actually counters not just ECM as an electronic, but also um, 
bundles of more advanced types of chaff made of different materials. Uh, the actual tactics and maneuver and tactics and things used by pilots will have increased dramatically, I'm sure, to combat these new threats from um, either or just general anti aircraft systems as a whole. Because don't oh, yeah. forget, without fight, the likelihood of us fighting a equivalent, you know, Soviet bloc jet or a jet or a Russian Federation jet is minute because um, it costs lots of money to get them over here to train. I believe the most, I mean, I believe the most exotic training I've ever heard of was back in the um, 70s where the US Air Force uh, got, uh, actually bought some uh, kafirs from Israel to train as um, their light fighters, the light fighters against because it was the most exotic platform at the time. Hmm. Uh, and very rarely do Western pilots get to fly against things like SG-27s and MiG-29s? I believe the most um, Eastern we can fight against is Polish MiG-29s. Interesting. And even, uh, well, and even you know, then... Ukraine sold US SC-27s and MiG-29s, that kind of stuff. Um, we can see them in the US being used. Mm. But the problem then is the is the Russia will have known this and Russia aren't on the S twenty seven anymore. You know what I mean? They're now working on stuff like the SU thirty seven and the SU thirty five and all sorts of stuff like that. So it's just very interesting. And don't forget the whole point of this kind of stuff is it's kinda of like an arms race and it's all very shadowy. You know, Russia develops this new system or it's not, I'd say, well, let's not use countries. Country A develops this system, so country B develops it to counter it. And the way to really well covered out... there with your political correctness. I uh, think my own impressive, my yeah. friend, impressive. Um, the only way to really ever know what your stuff is capable of is by being shot at by Very the true. stuff it's meant to fight and unfortunately that's um, a really expensive and risky thing yeah, to do yeah very so expensive and risky that. thing to do yeah. yeah and it's very interesting anyway we're getting more onto tactics there and development not Eurofighter Typhoon that's okay that's okay so um, we'll bring it on to Phoenix now Phoenix you may not know much about the Eurofighter either but uh, with what's been said so far what do you feel about the uh, the fighter jet itself yeah as you said I don't know that much about aircraft however the um... What I can see, it's starting to get a little older on the update platform, so it might mm -hmm. not be able to keep up with current technology mm -hmm. as well as uh, other aircraft. Yeah, I'll agree with you on that one for yeah. sure. It does seem like it's, although it's its day when it was produced, it seemed like a very, and it was a very highly modified fighter jet. It seems like nowadays it's the upgrade game, trying to keep up with the, you know, like people were saying, the arms race. A lot of them, um, almost all Western countries, still operate fighters that were thought of in the 1980s. The F-16 is a absolute world-beating example of this. That's just been upgraded time and time and time again. I believe there's rumours of Block 60 coming out soon. Mm -hmm. um, the no, has fake mode. Yeah. Have a guess how old the F-15 is. <laughs> oh yeah, it's 1970s, wasn't it, the F-15? Guess when the production farm closed. Uh, God. It's still open. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> They're still um, making them for other countries. Yep. <laughs> Uh, an interesting thing, in terms of Eurofighter upgrades, I believe we are currently on the Tranche 3, which is, in my opinion, I mean, I'm sure you get way better responses if I asked um, around at an Air Force station somewhere, like, what it's equivalent to. But from what I've seen at air shows, that kind of stuff, it kind of is equivalent to, like, a F-16 Block 52, like a modern one. They're at that kind of same level, mm -hmm. with the Eurofighter having various pros and cons to it, and they're near it. To, to be honest, its nearest comparison is the Rafale. Right. Uh, both of them having pros and cons. They're both what we call Gen 4.5 fighters. So they're not quite Generation 5, like F-22, F-35, but they're generation. They're just half a generation behind it. Okay. That kind of stuff. Cool. They still use pretty much all the same avionics, that kind of stuff, uh, just minus some other things that are quite shady, how you classify a fighter. Right. Anyway, moving on from that... Uh, Hopefully, in a few years' time, I'm not sure how well publicised it's going to be, we should be dropping a new upgrade to the Eurofighter Typhoon, and I'm sure uh, somewhere in your comment section, Matt, you'll have a much more knowledgeable guy than me. Uh, we'll be dropping Tranche like 4. Like the fuel tanks? Yes, like the F-16 Block 2 with the external, the um, built-in okay. external fuel tanks, that kind of stuff. We're getting Tranche 4, which is meant to basically bring it up to level of the F-35, that kind of area. A very complex system. What about external weapons pods? Yes, that is true. Problem is, internal external like, weapons pylons don't really don't really matter unless you want to build a stealth fighter. And I can tell you now, 
Your Vlader ain't stealth, and he's never gonna be stealth. It's our loud, proud, kill well, everyone, well, bomb things fighter. Well, what I'm referring to is, it, like I mentioned, Kuwait just bought the Eurofighter, but in a make the plot thicken because we're still making Super Hornets here, and I'm a bit of a Super Hornet fan. They're uh, already talking about an advanced Super Hornet that has conformal fuel tanks. That's sort of the new thing. Mm. And on the center pylon, an external weapons pod that would hopefully keep yeah. Ah, yeah. I've seen pictures of yeah, this. Yeah, I've seen these. I've seen these. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure Boeing's going to tell the Kuwaiti Air Force, "Hey, this is one thing your Super Hornets can do, but your <laughs> Eurofighters can't do." Yeah. What's your thoughts sure, on the Eurofighter springtime? Um, I've. Everything I've read says it sounds we won't sell you an F-22 because none of you guys are trustworthy, apparently. That's what <laughs> Congress said, at least. And I, I, think, I thought I've it was because they would, you didn't have enough to sell. <laughs> um, Lockheed Martin, I'm pretty sure, wants to sell them to the Royal Air Force, and I'm pretty sure there are Royal Air Force officers who were like, hey, that might be a nice plane to invest in, but... <laughs> we don't have the money. We, we don't have... Uh, no, stop, Will. Stop. Uh, stop. <laughs> okay, so we'll, we'll finish up on... We'll, an go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but if you want to get an airplane that's like an F-22, like with the radar, the weapons, you want to get a Eurofighter. That's everything I've ever read has said, like, you can't get an F-22, but... If you don't want to spend money thing. on like a new souped up F fifteen, get a Eurofighter. Yeah. Mm. True. And Britain oh god, has never really had we've we've always been very we like multi role. You know, we we like being able to do multiple jobs yeah. one plane. Apart from the tornado, which was the devil child of some of this. Um <laughs> uh, the tornado. My thought the on the uh, Eurofighter being it's Yeah. Is that it's Probably going to be used more and more as an air to air, and just let the F thirty five take over for the tornado. At least that's my take on it. It is. Yeah. It is the. Uh, Since the F thirty five is meant more for air to ground. It is. Yeah. I mean, the Eurofighter Typhoon is world beating in terms of uh, air to air fighting. It's mm -hmm. we have we do a lot of it in Britain. It's actually our main focus for our Eurofighter fleet is air to air. Air to ground takes second precedent for them. Okay, so uh, we'll finish up on that conversation. We'll move on to our final part of today's discussion, which is gaming, and specifically SteelBeast Pro. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, it is a tank simulation software, guys. If you haven't checked out SteelBeast Pro, there are a number of videos on my channel and also on some of these gentlemen's channels. So as I said before, please check the description below. Go check out their channels. Go look at some really fun SteelBeast Pro footage. A number of these gentlemen have also played the game with me uh, on my channel, and we had some really good times. Uh, and we take the game quite seriously and we do have a lot of passion in the game uh, i call it a game because when we play it it's technically a game however it is a simulation software uh, but i like to have fun when playing simulation software so i classify it as a game but uh, the features that we have always begged for eSIM games to place into the game who are the creators of steel beast pro um, are always on the back of our minds and we always have the the wish list so to speak to say hey this is something that I think would be really neat to have in the game. So what we're going to do, once again, we're just going to go from the top of the page of uh, our guest today and kind of give our own little two-minute spiel on the kind of features and vehicles even such that could potentially be put into the game and what we maybe expect eSIM games could, in the future, put into the game. So I'll start from the top and off we go. Uh, I'll keep mine quite short, cause, uh, short, short, as I have the lion's share of attention last uh, segment, but I would like to see some older tanks, because I think we need to pay a lot more respect to um, our generations of tanks, as they are still fighting today, I'm going to do a shame if Britain probably right now, <coughs> Centurion, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Also, I think we need more utilitarian vehicles we can fully simulate, like artillery or air defense, uh, because I'm tired of having to jockey my air defense around to make them do something. I mean, I did a scenario a few days ago where I had a Tunguska, and MI8s came over, that were the enemy. Tunguska didn't give a crap. Uh, you know, Traverse's turret, I thought it was going to be, oh yeah, I'm going to kill some MI8s. Didn't. They then landed and debunked about a company's worth of troops off, and the Tunguska sit there going, oh, yeah, hello, I'm a Tunguska. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that's my wish list, along with maybe a little bit better infantry AI. Agreed, agreed. Damien? Well, I would like to see a vehicle armor customization in the sense that we need something like a system where a mission designer can add uh, add on armor for the tanks. Uh, for example, we al already have a Challenger 2 in the game, 
uh, in the variant with the add-on armor and why, for example, not change it for the newer type or completely uh, take it off. Same with the Abrams series that has its own uh, up armor kit. Why not have it? Especially if, for example, someone would want to make modern uh, Iraqi operations, etc., uh, etc. Et um, other thing, I think the infantry indeed needs some improvement, and we need uh, a direct player control for the RPG operators because <laughs> yeah. close range vehicle and the RPG operator. And what happens? Well, RP RPG operator decides. Screw it, I will just <laughs> fly here and wait so, well, when vehicle sees me and kills me. So yeah, <laughs> you know, it's, it's needed, absolutely needed. And I think one more thing should be done. Uh, the game simulator received, as we all know, um, gra graphics upgrade recently. Yeah. And I really hope that more and more vehicles will receive the model upgrade update whatever you want to call it and we finally will have a challenger too with a fully model interior because <laughs> i want to see it yeah oh that'd be stellar yeah it's very <laughs> spacious you have, you have an office party in there <laughs> <laughs> okay ghost what's your opinions um my needs are much simpler um i was loving it when the bmp2 got announced and yep. i could see that they put out a lot of effort a fantastic looking cockpit i want the same for the t64 agreed so, oh, yes. so it was it was a major part of the Soviet Union doctrine. If you're going to have scenarios in Steel Beast that have Soviet Union doctrine and you can't be in a T64 uh, or a T80, which would be a long way away, I guess, but either one of them, if you can't really ride into battle with one of those, what's the fucking point? Right? <laughs> well, totally agree. All, why don't I have a radio that I can tune into and talk to my company live inside the game without fucking around with TeamSpeak or Discord or any of that other bullshit? Yeah, that's a that's a big one for sure. Is is uh, the radio yeah, nets not being accessible? And like people have said in the past, you know, it is specifically purposed for uh, militaries because it's technically a software. But that being the case, it would seem more apparent then that it would be so simple to put in a plugin that would allow us as um, personal edition players to utilize that. I totally agree with that. I think as as a simulation software, we really do need a good VoIP radio net. You know, Armour has, has that. It. Yeah, exactly. Armour has, has it. It's very... Well, Armour has a mod like a for it. Update. True. Go ahead, Joe. With, with Armour, you need an external mod. But if you look at Squad, Squad has a built-in... Project Reality. <laughs> Sorry? Project Reality has one. That's eight. That's yeah. three years old. Yeah. yeah, but if you look at Squad and that they already have it built-in, then I don't see why a simulator can do it. Mm. True. What about you, Joel? What's like your paid update? Yeah, true. Joel, what's your opinion on it? Uh, about uh, the game, uh, I would like to see a bit more control over your uh, soldiers as mm -hmm. well, because we all know that the battles today, when tanks are included, heavily depend on infantry support. Yeah, for uh, sure. Especially with those city fights, you don't send in a tank into a city when you know there are insurgents on the rooftops. Yeah. You want and if you want to know why, go, go, type, go type tanks in Aleppo and watch them all blow up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I would like to see more control on that, because as people said, the AI is, well, I would say it's pretty dumb. It's Finicky. I, I mean, I'm no soldier, but I, if I know how to do it better, then you have a problem. So um, I would like to see more control over it, uh, like Damien said. Uh, give me the option to fire the RPG or let me... Exactly true. Let me play it as a shooter or something. Uh, I don't mean become another battlefield, but at least give me that control because it's a bit clunky right now. Well, they let you take control of the light machine guns, like the M60s and the the GPS and yeah, stuff I mean, like that. Yeah, when you walk around and stuff like that, it's a bit finicky with the controls. Make it more smooth. And I agree. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Infantry, and that that brings me on to my biggest pet peeve with the game is. Like Jaw was just mentioning there, armor doesn't work inherently good without infantry support or any kind of support, and I think the game has definitely dropped the ball on that. Now, we all know it's a tank simulation software, but it would be nice to be able to utilize infantry a little bit more effectively. Now, you can't really give them too much shit for that, because inherently they're not specifically trying to create an infantry simulation software. However, you can't just drop that whole segment of the game so much to the point where it doesn't work well with yeah. armor. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a little immersion breaking when yes. you have you and your op for um, two feet away, bang, playing, playing shoot, shooting at each other, prone in a ditch next to each other, um, going bang, 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 protracted for 15 minutes when they're sitting in the open without any cover between them, yeah. two feet apart. Yeah. How about and you, Phoenix? A, oh, sorry, okay. go ahead, Joe. And I think it's a problem overall with the AI, though, because if you, even if you look at tanks and clearing a minefield, you see them do really strange things at times. <laughs> strange is an understatement. <laughs> uh, God, I had one guy that she ate very quickly for uh, featured initially. It's a mine clearer who drove into the minefield and killed himself. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's special. How about you, Phoenix? What's your opinion on it? Well, nothing too grand, I guess, but uh, better ground simulation, like put spin tires into the game. Agreed. Very <laughs> yeah, nice. Have yeah, so, so that, you ha that later on. Yeah, but uh, so you uh, have to be more mindful where you actually drive and command your vehicles, mm -hmm. so they don't get stuck. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as as um, Ghost Dog was mentioning there, hopefully in the near future they're going to have a, an engine pull in place that's going to allow us to do that a lot more but i totally agree i think terrain is inherently something very important to armored fighting vehicles and utilizing just flat open 2d terrain like that is is you know going to make it very simplistic for you to to engage other armor but yeah i, I agree for sure it does need to have a bit of work but hopefully the new update from ec esim should be coming out does anyone know when that update should be coming no so idea Soon, soon, yeah. soon yeah. T TBC, and uh, finally, springtime. What's your opinions on Steel Beast Pro? Well, besides having to get a new license, but that's another story. <laughs> um, yep. One of the things that has, and I'm going to be honest, turned me off from the game is that if I, I've tried to like make more interesting scenarios where like I'm commanding a company, maybe CV nineties. You know how fun those things are. Yeah. But at least the AI. I mean, I can understand the infantry. Maybe just make it more like rock paper scissors or whatever. But as far as anti-tank support, like if you're a country like the Netherlands, I don't know why this isn't an aspect. It should yeah. be better in the game, in my opinion. Yeah. Finland and Netherlands are pretty much down to CV-90s. Yes, yeah. The anti-tank units should have way better AI. They should not be as able to work with as they are in the game, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it would be nice, I think, to have some more options for anti-tank weapon systems. Because, I mean, what are we limited to? Javelins, uh, Javelin, 84s, Milan, yeah. and Reagan... Yeah, Milan, Dragon, Toe, Spike, ER, uh, the weird anti-aircraft one, um, <coughs> Metis, no Metis, yeah, 84. Conkers. And, and Conkers, yeah, Conkers. Thank you, thank you, and the 82, <laughs> the Saga. Nice. I mean, that's really just my one thing that I'd like, is just, you know, like, if you, the anti tanking should, they just always seem to be kind of buggy, in my opinion, for some reason. Mm -hmm. Are you meaning the anti-tank troops? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they, I've noticed they take, seem to take forever and a goddamn day to get set up as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. It's like with 80 gems. Um, one of my most famous example of this is on a ghost live stream where he looks at me through a T72 sight. I set it up perfectly, <laughs> perfectly in ambush. Actually, he was just about to finish loading in the damn thing when ghost comes around the corner. It says it's loaded. I press the trigger, you know, so fire at will. He sits there for about 30 seconds just looking at ghost, tracking him. So I jump in. Press the space bar, Ghost smashes at me with MG before it, the missile even leaves the tube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a team. Wait, that's an ATGM. Wait, that's pointing at me. Shit. Yeah, the um, panic. I mean, I'm a guy who used funny. to play End War. I can deal with rock, paper, scissors, infantry, but <laughs> anti tank teams need to be more on the ball. Yeah, especially for a tank simulation game. <laughs> Okay, so we um, trying to sell it overseas, where you don't have that many modern tanks, but you can buy maybe some modern infantry fighting vehicles. You'd think you'd want to be able to show off that one aspect. Hell true, no! True. If, if you live overseas and you're, you know, you're a small military, you want to buy eighty gems, Syria, hence. <laughs> yeah. As we were just talking about in our previous topic. Um, okay, guys, so I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, I really do appreciate all of you stopping by to take part in this discussion today. Um, I really do. It's much appreciated. I think we're going to continue on this uh, kind of discussion format that we've got going on here on the channel. As I mentioned, once again, please, guys, go check out these guys' channels. And also, please feel free to stop by into my Discord uh, on the Legion to come thank these guys and introduce yourselves to them yourselves. As I said before, these guys have so much information, whether it be on games, uh, 
uh, armor, air, um, and just general having fun. We have a really good chit chat on Discord all the time. We play some games together. So you have any interest in coming along and playing, and even potentially in the future joining in with some of these discussions and featuring on uh, my channel or some of the other guys' channels, then hopefully you can do that. Um, I do really appreciate you also for stopping by and watching today. I'm sure the guys do too. And uh, I'm going to let these guys say goodbye. Uh, this is Figma 42, Fence Out, RTB. Hey, it was very nice to talk with you all. So, see you later. Looking forward to hearing from you all again sometime in the comments. Catch you soon. Thank you all for watching and see you next time. Bye bye. Yeah, I'll catch you later. Bye bye. Okay, guys, thanks again for joining me and thank you all for watching. All the best, have a great day, and bye bye.